Well, hello everyone. Hello again. We're about to conclude our 11th topic, nationalism, on this uh, NPTEL ideologies course 2019-20. We're going to look at three examples of different forms of nationalism which are currently very much in the public eye at this time. The three uh, examples, one is, uh, I've taken this from the German news magazine Der Spiegel International, and it's a lengthy account of uh, the movement within Germany's right-wing or far-right party, the, the AFD, the Alternative für Deutschland, of a movement, as Spiegel itself says, towards right-wing extremism. That's the first, that's the longest item we'll look at. The second one is a consequence of, of this. Uh, the Spiegel article was published in um, September 2019. It's freely accessible on the net, and I shall send you the slide, of course, put that up for you to, to gain access uh, with the uh, lecture topic. But the second one is an article published in The Guardian on February the 10th, 2020. That's two, two days ago. Today it's the 12th of February. There's another long article in, in uh, the British, several long articles in the British press. We'll look at this one from the 10th of February. Needless to say, the German press is full of uh, reportage and comment on uh, the fact that the leader, not the Chancellor of Germany, but the leader of the governing party in Berlin has resigned over the development, uh, developments which led to a new coalition government in the province of Thuringia after a recent state-level election. The third article is by uh, Joanna Kakisis, and it's on National Public Radio in, uh, in the United States, dated the 14th of January 2020. It was a broadcast, and the transcript is, is on the net, and it's freely accessible. Uh, freely accessible. The uh, second and third articles we look at are both quite short. We'll start with the, um, the Der Spiegel article by several members of the staff of Der Spiegel, which is a heavyweight German news magazine. Uh, the uh, the website is of course on um, uh, will be uh, you know in a PowerPoint that we send you, that we make available to you, and we'll um, we'll start by looking at this item. Here we are. Quite simply, in recent state elections, the right wing populist party Alternative for Germany in German Alternative für Deutschland. AFD or AFD won almost a quarter of the votes. Their winning candidates were mainly from the right-wing fringe of this party. Newly elected state assembly members, they've been winning substantial numbers of seats in states, state assemblies as well, provincial assemblies. Uh, the members include elected legislators at state level, include a tile setter, uh, someone who, who sets tiles in, in buildings and houses, an electrician, and a lawyer, for example, who's been uh, openly Islamophobic. The party claims to represent voters, to represent sections of society in a particular way. The German word it uses, that is the AFD uses, or members of the AFD use, is bürgerlich. The term connotes representation of the middle class and adherence to democratic and social norms. But, as the Spiegel article says, most of the recent AFD candidates who were voted, for example, into the Brandenburg and Saxony assemblies, into those respective assemblies, favor an extremist wing of the AFD. It's called the Flügel, which I think means wings in German. And this wing is noted for racism and ethno-nationalism. This, uh, this wing, this um, section, it's not a formal section, uh, of, the, uh, of the AFD. It's also under observation by the German State Security Service for potential hostility to the German constitution. Uh, a member of an institute for research on conflict and violence, the, um, this, this researcher is called Wilhelm Heitmeier, has used the term civic coarseness. And by that he means a respectable-looking facade with 
ruthless rhetoric and aggressively authoritarian tendencies. So, in fact, there's been virtually unprecedented discussion recently over this particular point. Uh, two points in particular. One, one is whether or not the AFD have roots in the center of German society. Are they quite as bürgerlich as they say they are? The second is whether or not they should be excluded because many of them don't even try to hurt, hide their um, earlier neo-Nazi links. Now, there have been significant changes in the wider party political space, and that's one reason why uh, the AFD, these questions are being raised about the AFD, because their position has itself changed very greatly. What are the main changes in the party political space? First of all, the post-war space was effectively a three-party system made up of the CDU, the uh, Christian Democrat Union, the S SPD, the SDP, the Social Democratic Party, and the Free Democratic Party, the Freie Demokratische Partei. And they in effect formed a three-party system uh, quite a lot of the time, particularly with CDU governments such as that of Helmut Kohl in Berlin. The Free Democratic Party got seats in a coalition, got uh, formed part for a coalition with the CDU. That did mean the holding significant posts in the uh, central government in, in what was in Bonn at the time. And uh, that was the, uh, the federal capital. For example, for at least two terms, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, um, the FDP minister Klaus Kinkel held the foreign ministry in Germany in at least two of Kohl's, um, Kohl's governments from, from uh, the, the 80s through the 90s. Now, from the late 1970s onwards, changes started to appear. The Greens made an immense impact in the late 70s, winning substantial numbers of seats in the federal parliament and starting to win substantially more seats in the state assemblies. After the unification of Germany in 1992 with the, uh, with the fall of the Berlin Wall in, um, in uh, I beg your pardon, in, in uh, German unification took place in, in um, the early 90s, yes, but the fall of the wall dates from late, well, 1990, thereabouts, if I'm not mistaken. And um, after unification, more parties, for example, Die Linke, the left party, which had partial connections to the old Communist Party in the former German Democratic Republic, the former East Germany, started to appear and started to win seats, particularly in state assemblies. And this range of parties has, in effect, created a space which the AFD think they can fill. Now, let's look back at what happened when the Greens started winning state-level seats in the 1980s. Well, the, the, the reactions were, were quite revealing. The uh, other parties saw the Greens, uh, you know, not just the other parties, but some of the media, saw the Greens as, I quote, chaotic political incompetence who posed a threat to Western culture. They actively advocated significant redirection of the whole economy, significant legislation to protect the environment, in effect a rethinking of our human relationship with with the environment, our recognition of our place in it. We've seen these kinds of issues in, in the ecologism topic. And the Greens turned up in Parliament, in the Federal Parliament, in casual clothes, in casual jackets with long hair, and in leather slippers. They said they represented the public, and nobody had any right to demand that they wore formal dress in Parliament. There were some very formidable figures. And they included Joschka Fischer, later Foreign Minister of Germany, and one of the most formidable figures in German politics, indeed in the whole of European politics. Now, the criticisms of the Greens, um, well, started to be moderated as the policies started to make more and more sense and came to be adopted by the other two parties. Many Green policies in Germany are now mainstream politics. This is true in other particularly Northern European countries as well. 
Similar things happened to Die Linke over its East German origins. They were often described as dangerous communists from the old East German days, from the old GDR days, but they've continued and are winning seats in state assemblies. They came close to forming, to being part of a coalition government in, I think, 2004 or 2005, when the federal election, the central parliament, uh, the election to the Bundestag, the, uh, the, the federal parliament, was inconclusive, and um, the, the broad left, that is the, the CDU, the, uh, not, I beg your pardon, not the CDU, the SDP, the Social Democratic Party, uh, and the Greens had to decide whether to invite Die Linke, the left party, into a coalition. That did not happen. Uh, the two uh, other parties decided not to invite the uh, Die Linke in, and um, uh, various other coalitions have, have um, held office in, in Berlin since then. But there's one common element here. In Germany, almost all parties, until very recently, joined in persistent criticism of the rising right. I'll just give you a bit of background here. The uh, unification of Germany was not a straightforward matter. A great deal of industry in the former GDR simply could not compete with West German industry. There were social tensions as well. We'll meet those again as we, as we proceed. In the uh, early to mid-90s, unemployment in the former GDR, in the provinces which had been in the GDR, reached over 25%. And uh, as the German ambassador in New Delhi at the time publicly acknowledged, publicly said, um, that level of unemployment did give opportunities to, to a hard right, to hard right sections of opinion in the former East Germany, the former GDR, including the re-emergence or the emergence of neo-Nazi movements. But the AFD have, over the last few years, made a significantly greater impact throughout Germany. This results in relatively unusual coalitions, which it turns out nobody wants. For example, one province has a coalition between the CDU, that's the Christian Democrat Union, the SDP, or S SPD in Germany, the Soziale Partei Demokratische, and... Um, and the Greens. Now, it's not surprising that the uh, SPD and Green policies are often significantly at variance with those of the uh, CDU, the Conservative Party. But the result is that the coalition agreements have to be, have to be very detailed. And they take a long time to work out, they're tricky to work out, they require a lot of manoeuvring, some might even say horse trading between the parties, and it means there's very little space left for any other policies or projects. One result is, as the Spiegel article says, stagnation. It looks as though nothing is moving. I will add a, an evaluative point here that may in fact confirm that stagnation isn't quite the wrong way to quite the right way to look at it this could convey an element of achieved stability on the broad agreement with the broad agreement in the background that the far right and neo nazis are not to be allowed a space are are to be kept out of it and there are good reasons why any democratic polity might need to think in those terms. And I, I take it further and say needs to think in those terms. But this, this kind of detailed negotiation over policy between three-party coalitions in various provinces results in what looks to the public very much like stagnation. It looks as though nothing is happening. All the politicians are sitting around trying to reach agreement and they finally come up with what may look like you know, compromise policies. It has been said, this is just a, a rough, very rough analogy, that a camel is a horse designed by a committee. Now, it's just occurred to me to say that. It may look to sections of the German public 
that the policies resulting from these odd-looking coalitions are a bit like a camel. Of course, a camel is a perfectly good natural phenomenon, and it's a bit unfair to call it a horse designed by a committee, but the analogy may serve to, to, to convey the kind of thing that is occurring in, um, uh, in, in provinces with these rather odd coalitions, or perhaps previously unpredictable coalitions. But it is, these, it is this kind of stagnation, as we've seen with fascism, that gives the far right an opportunity to say, yeah, they're all stalled, they're all quarreling with each other, we get neglected, or words to that effect. And as a result, uh, a group was proposed, started in 2013, partly in response to perceived stagnation in many of the state assemblies, and partly in response to concerns about the euro, the currency devised by the European Union under the, the Maastricht Treaty, which requires uh, forms of political and, uh, and economic union uh, and requires a, a single currency. Member states don't have to join the single currency. The United Kingdom is an obvious example. I understand that, um, that Sweden hasn't either and so on. Germany, of course, and France are very much members of the Eurozone and have the Euro as their currency. The AFD, the Alternative für Deutschland, started in 2013, and it was started by economics professors who opposed the Euro. And that did, I mean, some of their commitments to, certainly in hostility to to the, what they saw as the imposition of largely macroeconomic policies and fiscal policy by the, by the European institutions of the European Union, um, uh, did attract many more people from what we would call the hard right or far right. Now, at first, they were such new entrants into the AFD were not, not exactly mainstream. Right? Economics professors and, and hard right hard right supporters didn't necessarily go together, but the hard right members of the AFD didn't mind being marginalized within the party. Partly because the centrists, the economics professors and those who weren't quite as hard right and so on, the centrists gave the party as a whole more respectability or, if I've got the term right, Bürgerlichkeit. They look, made them look more respectable. Then, bit by bit, a hard right to take over the party occurred. This may well have been planned. Uh, there was a takeover, and now the focus is on identity, on assert assertions of identity, on nationalism, a nationalist tone, an authoritarian understanding of the state, a racist and exclusionary view of society, even when that's based on hearsay evidence. People may say, oh, nothing's happened in my town or village, but you know, so many kilometers along the road, I've heard stories that things have happened in the towns and cities and so on. And that's been publicized. That's received public documentation. Now, it's been certainly been documented publicly. Hearsay evidence has contributed to the uh, attractiveness of the AFD's racist and exclusionary view of society. Local failures have also been part of this. One interviewee reported in the Spiegel article says, oh, you know, the local council, the local corporation haven't built the bike path they, they meant, they said they would build. I very much like commuting to work by, uh, by bicycle, on my bicycle, and they haven't done this. The AFD say they'll do it. Well, I'm going to vote against the other lot and for the AFD because the other lot haven't carried out their promises to, to improve our local facilities and amenities. So the focus, I'll go through that list again, the AFD focus is now on identity, on nationalism, on an authoritarian understanding of the state, an exclu a racist and exclusionary view of society, even where there may be no hard evidence to support it, even where there isn't, and on failures to carry out local promises. This, is, this does widen their appeal. This has had the effect of widening their appeal very considerably. A further result is an overall lack of trust. 
And this means that the AFD's appeal is much stronger in the East, in the former East Germany, the GDR, than in West Germany. First of all, the 1989 protests brought down a long-established and fairly hardline communist government. So the power of the 1989 protests has not been forgotten. People know that if they get out on the streets and protest, and they protested peacefully, they could achieve huge things. Secondly, reunification, or unification as it's more often called in Germany, was a great shock. Brought about the near destruction of the East German, of the GDR economy, created significant unemployment, and introduced East German society to what would no doubt have looked to them like much tougher and more demanding conditions of life in, in West Germany. Things like um, family life, and East Germans have said this, they found their own marital relationships suffering under the pressures of working in the new economy. Secondly, the change in work conditions was also a great shock, and unequal work conditions across the, uh, the West, across, from West Germany, across West Germany and the former East Germany, certainly contributed to a feeling of alienation following the unification. The younger generation often started to emigrate in search of work. And as members of citizens of the European Union, which came into being in 1992, and of course of the former EEC, they could do so quite freely. Thirdly, everyday life in the former GDR continued to be, well, rather less easy than it, apparently easy than it was in West Germany, in what had been the Federal Republic. Uh, Supermarkets were much fewer in number. Daycare facilities, which had been run by the state in the GDR, were now much fewer in number. Medical practices, again, seemed to be much fewer in number. The change in healthcare systems was no doubt a great surprise to, to citizens of the former GDR. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, German healthcare is based on an insurance system in which those in work, their employers, and the state pay into an insurance fund which people can draw on when they need treatment. In the GDR, of course, it was the state that provided childcare facilities, creches and so on, and medical care. And uh, no doubt this was off, um, I'm sure this was of a very high standard. So former citizens, citizens of the former GDR, now German citizens in, in the uh, Federal Republic, started to feel left behind. Many also had a profound hurt over being seen by many West Germans as rather backwards, as having perhaps not moved with the times because they'd been in this, in this rather rigid, fixed communist society in the past. They started to feel like losers in the process of modernization. This has created a very deep sense of resentment, perhaps even of exclusion and of being how should I put it, second class in Germany, one of the most highly developed and modern countries in the world, and one of the most stable in many of its political and social systems. Now this has undoubtedly contributed to, to the rise of the AFD, and um, there we are. We need to mention a, an additional feature, which is that for people in that position, and no doubt for a great many West Germans as well, people in the former West Germany, uh, there's a great deal of, of uncertainty, um, disquiet, about what they perceive as a substantial influx, influx of refugees from, from the Middle East, from the many wars in the Middle East. We know very well that those wars have been initiated by the United States and the United Kingdom, in particular the invasion of Iraq in 2003. But Germany did open its doors to refugees from Syria in particular uh, and the culture shock on both sides for the refugees as well as for, for Germans um, has been considerable. Now all these factors have, con have contributed to a sense of exclusion, resentment and neglect on the part of a great many Germans. Now, the perception of stagnation in the official political process and the official party system has then meant that the AFD were probably um, starting to move into fertile ground when they moved from, from uh, 
largely opposing the euro, to addressing these social and political resentments or claiming to address them and express them, when none of the other parties seemed to do so. A sociologist named, uh, a professor named Holger Lengfeld has said the AFD represents values that, I quote, nobody else is offering, including many positions formerly held by West German conservatives, who, for the most part, have distanced themselves from, from Nazi or quasi-Nazi or neo-Nazi tendencies throughout Germany for a very long time. Now that's the Spiegel article. We can see how the AFD look as though they could fill a space that a great many voters want filled. Uh, they now hold something like 25% of seats in the federal parliament and between 25 and 30 in many of the state assemblies. We're going to look at some consequences and we shall now look at an article in the British newspaper, The Guardian. I'll just summarize it. Obviously, I can't put the text up for you. We'll look at that now and see what, um, well, startling effects um, have occurred very recently. Let's take a look. OK. Uh, yes, I'll have to call this up. Here we are. I'll just summarize this for you. I obviously can't put the text up, um, so I'll just summarize this. Here we are. Two days ago, right, I'm sorry about the delay. Two days ago, the uh, leader of the party of government in Berlin, that is the CDU party. The leader is not the chancellor, but the leader, Ann-Margret Kramp-Karrenbauer, who was also Angela Merkel, Chancellor Merkel's um, designated successor, announced that she would not run for the German chancellorship at the next federal election and she was going to step down as leader of the Christian Democrat Union. That is the Christian Democratic Union, the CDU, broadly conservative governing party. That was reported on Monday morning, that was the 10th of February. Now, the reason seems to have been, or the precipitating factor seems to have been, a fierce political controversy in the province of Thuringia where there had been a provincial election and CDU, elected CDU members in the state assembly, the Landtag of Thuringia, decided that they would cooperate with AFD in forming a co co coalition provincial government. This, this cut across a ban issued by the party, the party central headquarters on cooperation with the AFD. That ban has been called a firewall and it has been a feature of post-war German politics, of course, since the end of the war. That firewall has clearly been breached. Annegret Kramp-Karrenbauer, the leader of the CDU, she won the contest to succeed Chancellor Merkel as leader of the CDU. That was last De December 2018. And yet she has decided that this uh, was too much. She said she would not run for, run for chancellor, although the coalition government, the grand coalition between the Social Democrats and the CDU, uh, will continue in Berlin. So the party government in, in Berlin continues as a grand coalition. But the difficulties were actually located in Thuringia, in the province of Thuringia. What happened there was that the, uh, the CDU branch in Thuringia, after a recent state election, voted together with the AFD 
to oust, to remove the state premier Bodo Ramelow. Now, Ramelow is from Die Linke, again, you know, from the, uh, the former GDR left party, or the GDR uh, left with its roots in the GDR. Um, and this was too much, that a CDU uh, provincial party could cooperate with the AFD to remove a state premier. I instead, uh, a premier was installed from the, f from the FDP, and under the uh, provincial provi uh, proportional electoral system, the, uh, this particular person from the FDP had only got 5% of the vote. He had got his seat. But to have someone as chief minister of a state, minister president in, in, uh, in Germany, um, was, well, caused fierce controversy itself, controversy itself. Now, Chancellor Merkel also intervened here and said it was unforgivable, that's, a, that's the actual word she used, for democratic parties, meaning the CDU, to win majorities with the help of the AFD. Now that has also been seen as showing how little personal authority the CDU leader, Kramp Karrenbauer, had. Uh, that, uh, you know, is something German pol politicians or observers have been commenting on. Now, the upshot then is that Kramp Karrenbauer resigned as leader of the CDU. The province of Thuringia had a minister president, a chief minister, who only got 5% of the vote when he stood for election. It, it is a propor fully proportional system in the state elections. Since then, that particular minister president has resigned. That, uh, I think, happened yesterday, the 11th of February. But the issue for us is something that, that could present itself in almost any democratic system. To what extent do non-far-right parties consider or have to consider or have to collaborate, consider collaborating or have to collaborate with far-right parties. The question there is the kind of message far-right parties project and the kinds of support they get. And that's an issue that certainly, you know, with the IFD getting between 25, about a quarter of the votes across Germany is something that German parties really have to face. They also will have, yeah, I mean, no doubt they'll do this, they will also have to face, as do parties elsewhere in other systems, um, the kinds of resentment that are being expressed in these, in this increased support for far-right parties. Whether these are only resentments or have to do with substantive issues uh, of policy and so on, well, we have to see. It certainly is a serious predicament. And, of course, as we've seen with fascism and with nationalism, uh, appeals to extreme forms of nationalist unity, whether ethnic, linguistic, racial, religious, and so on, do often fall on very fertile ground when people have a generalized sense of res resentment, neglect, and stagnation. Well, it doesn't always have to be like that. We're going to look at an item which shows a considerable contrast. So, the item we're going to look at is this one. It's a short broadcast on National Public Radio in the United States. We'll send you the link. The link is freely accessible. The heading is The Scottish National Party is espousing a multicultural brand of nationalism. Okay, the host of the particular program uh, is Ari Shapiro. He goes across to one of their reporters. Uh, in this context, he goes across to one of their reporters, that's Joanna Kakisis. Um, and the context is this. Shapiro sets the, sets the scene pointing out that uh, the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has rejected the Scottish Government's request for another referendum on independence. Scotland had a referendum in 2014, which was lost, I think, by 53 to 47 or so, if I've got the figures right. Um, there's, there's been changes in opinion since then. Scottish nationalists wanted this vote because, this second referendum, because um, 
the UK, well, has now left the European Union and has done so against the wishes of 62% of Scots who voted to remain in the EU. And um, a lot of Scottish independence supporters are saying that Scotland has been dragged out of the EU against the wishes of a majority of people in Scotland. They say Scot Scottish nationalism or observers uh, and participants in Scottish politics say that Scottish nationalism reflects an, I quote, international and inclusive culture. So at that point, Shapiro goes over to the reporter, who may or may not have been in Scotland. I'm, I think she was. I get, get the impression she was at the time. Uh, and says, well, certainly. SNP, Scottish National Party supporters, marched for Scottish independence, often wearing tartan kilts and playing bagpipes. And uh, Theresa Duffy of the independence group I Aberdeen says Scots are very serious about being Scottish. And she goes to the interviewee who says, there's all the tartan, the bagpipes, the this, that, certainly the accents, whatever. That's true, the history and so on. But there's a phrase in Scotland, we're all Jock Tamsin's bairns. Which means, I quote, it doesn't matter where you're from. We're all part of humanity. In effect, Scotland cannot live by these, truly live by these words unless it breaks away from the UK. And the interviewee points out, it's not just independence for the sake of it. She says, if the UK was a fair democratic place, which was more welcoming, I wouldn't be so bothered. It's a fair point to make. A lot of people in Scotland are deeply troubled about the tone and tenor of public life in, in the UK. In the whole UK, particularly south of the border in, in England. Now another member is interviewed, Leo Marwick, and he says, well, many voters believe that the UK would remain in the EU and not turn against migrants. And he says he wants people to feel welcome from every corner of the world, just as they, sh they should feel this is their home, just as it is my home. And he's a Scot talking. Okay, Ben Jackson of Oxford University is uh, joking, he says, oh yes, but they want this unless, you know, feel this is your home unless you're, Eng unless you're English. Well, he's joking, I repeat, he's joking. He's actually writing a book about Scottish nationalism, he's based at Oxford University, and he says, well, Scotland, Scots who want independence are trying to define themselves against England rather than against Europe, while English nationalism is defined against Europe. And the tone of English political life, public life, rather, rather confirms that these days. Um, now, according to Ben Jackson of Oxford University, Europe is, the term Europe is used almost instrumentally by Scottish nationalists to provide an alternative framework. He may or may not be right, but that's what he says. That's his way of reading it. And uh, the interviewer for, on behalf of NPR says, well, the word nationalism does carry some ugly quotations. And here's someone studying nationalism at the University of Edinburgh. His name is Nassim Mir. He says, yes, those connotations are nasty, racially exclusive, exclusive and involve thoughts of blood and soil. We're familiar with those from our coverage of the topic of fascism. So here's someone who's studying nationalism at the University of Edinburgh and who points to governments in Hungary. He does mention India as using nationalism to marginalize ethnic or religious minorities. I don't doubt that if we asked him for evidence, he would provide plenty of authoritative evidence to support his argument. So here Nassim Mir says, well, you find in Scotland that ethnic minorities claim a sense of ownership over Scottish national identity. They feel Scots, in effect. The Scottish National Party sees Scotland as being kind of a a rainbow nation, a mosaic. That's Nassim Mir, Mir's own words. Language is one reason. All Scots speak English, according to the interviewer, Joanna, Joanna Kakisis. Um, all Scots speak English, while other separatist nations like Catalonia hang on to their own language. And there's an agreement here from Nassim Mir. Language does often underpin a claim to nationhood, but that's, um, you know, that's not remotely a challenge in Scotland. It's not an issue in Scotland. Um, you know, Gaelic is, yes, spoken or sung by fewer than 60,000 Scots, but <laughs> apparently, uh, and apparently more Scots actually speak um, Punjabi and Urdu than speak Gaelic. And they then cut to somebody who's speaking 
I presume in Urdu, it may be Punjabi or Hindi, but who switches to English for the interview and says, I lived in Scotland for 19 years. I'm 100% with Scotland. And he says he moved there. This is somebody called Muhammad Subten um, Muhal. Uh, and he says, I've lived in Scotland for 19 years. I moved here. He says he moved from the north of England, where he never did feel English. And he now feels fairly Scottish. Another interviewee, an engineer, says Scotland feels just as comfortable as the country where he was born, Ghana. He calls himself Afro-Scot and laughs at it. And the interviewer says, well, an independent Scotland may not exist anytime soon, quotes, quotes uh, Mr. Emmanuel, Archie Emmanuel, saying this, um, but Scotland is here to stay. And that's the end of the, end of the, uh, the item. Notice the contrast from the, the undoubtedly serious challenge posed by AFD in Germany with what very much looks like a hard right, very probably racially and ethnically exclusivist platform, and certainly an aggressive form of exclusivist nationalism. Look at the contrast between that and what's being said in Scotland, where the independence movement is no doubt strong and even possibly very strong, but seeks statehood without any claim to ethnic, linguistic or religious exclusivity or uh, any monopoly over what is to count as being Scottish. That is the kind of thing I meant when in the lecture I spoke of statehood without nationalism. That concludes our topic of nationalism, the 11th topic. We shall go on in the next lecture to our 12th topic, concluding topic, which is republicanism and citizenship.